So Jerusalem, the Holy Land, uh, where Palestinians and Israelis are sharing the same city, I think it's the only city in the world where you have all the religions in one city. Uh, here we are in the French Hill. The French Hill, it's on the eastern mountains of Jerusalem, where from the other side we can see now uh, the Jordan Valley, and we can see Amman and Jordan. Uh, then we have here Mount Scopus, Mount of Olives. And on the right half, we have here the amazing uh, city, Jerusalem. Uh, you can see the two parts, the old city and the new city. There is huge differences between the tech sector in Palestine and in Israel, what they call the startup nation. We as a Palestinian living in East Jerusalem, I, I can't be as a part of the startup nation. I want to be, but I'm not of that nation. So my idea was, if we can be a startup region by giving others, the Arabs, the Palestinians, the Jordanians, and everyone from the Middle East, and yes, we can do it here with all the globalization in this world. Now it's time just to join the forces together, to start working together. So we are here in the Holy Land, the region of the Holy Land. Let's start, take the Holy Land again on the technology level and how we are going to change the world. The best startup which was created in this part of the world is the State of Israel, which was a fantasy which made no financial or no economic sense whatsoever. Just like you have mining cities, fabrication cities, we are a startup nation, that's what we are. In many ways, innovation for us has always been a necessity. We had to be global before the word global existed. Gaza is amongst the most innovative that I've seen. You know, when the fuel shortages start, they start running their, their cars on cooking oil. I think because of the closure, because of the repeated shocks of conflict, they're innovating to survive. As Palestinians, we need to stop thinking of ourselves as victims, and we need to think of ourselves as people who, despite of our situation, can actually offer something to the world. For tech startups, there's many, many challenges. The majority of them, I can say, are due to the occupation. Uh, and I think we have to be completely honest and forthright about those challenges. We don't have to wait for the end of the occupation to start improving the economy. We could start earlier. The occupation is going to end. This generation, they're at a point where they want to see changes. We know that there's not much we can do for the political situation or the economy, but we can do something with our own two hands and create a product. If this conflict someday is resolved, the potential of what this region can build together, not just Palestinians and Israelis, but the whole Middle East, is nothing short of massive. I truly believe we live in a unique time in history from a technological perspective. Because of the convergence of exponential computation growth and decline in prices, and because of the fact that the capital required to get in the game is very low, we no longer have paradigms. We live in an era of a permanent revolution. It's not that it happens here and here and then it becomes shorter, it's hap it happens in parallel. Cost of certain types of sensors has gone down so much and their capacity has exponentially grown. Because of phone makers having the pressure to make amazing cameras that are so tiny so that we can take selfies and send to our, to our friends, this pressure creates a situation that this sensor that was created for the camera of the iPhone now can play a role in the ecosystem. Two years ago, Kickstarter provided liquidity of half a billion dollars in one year without taking equity from anyone. The biggest venture capital funds in the world don't do that. You have this era of permanent revolution on the technological sense. It meets reduction, massive reduction in price, and then everyone can afford it, at least at the entry level. Now a guy in Israel can look at that sensor and say, hey, 4K capability in a $7 chip? I can revolutionize agriculture. Because if I can look at the variance of color of an apple in different stages, instead of losing 30% of the produce, I'll lose 10% of the produce. Another person in India looks at exactly the same thing and says, hey, $7 chip, I can generate an innovation in automotive. This is a tremendous period, and that's where you see immunotherapy and you're seeing so many interrelated or converging fields. 
I think Israel is very, very well positioned to leverage the opportunities of the era of permanent revolution. But clearly, when you look at the convergence, if it continues to double every year in terms of capacity, and the prices are cut in half across the board, we are in a tremendous point in history. It's not going to get slower from here on end. Israel is second only to Silicon Valley in terms of startups and VC investment. I think there are several main factors that lead to Israel today being known as the startup nation, as this nation of entrepreneurs. My name is Saul Singer. I'm the co-author of Startup Nation, which is the book about what made Israel innovative. Shimon Peres, of course, is the person we quote most in the book entirely, but perhaps my favorite quote is defining Israelis or Jews in one word, and that word is dissatisfied. We used to call Israel for time to time the dissatisfaction nation. And when you look at the history of the country, it makes a lot of sense, because we were the builders of the country. There were people who were dissatisfied from where they were. They had to flee. And they came here and they had to make this place work because this was their final station. This was their final stop. This was their, their refuge. You have millions of refugees coming from Europe, World War II and the Holocaust, and then millions more from the Arab world who were kicked out of the Arab world at exactly the same time. So you have this flood of, of basically refugees coming to Israel then called Palestine. No one could quite make their mind up about what was then Palestine. The League of Nations, which was the forerunner of the United Nations, gave it to Britain, which was still then a major colonial power to administer. The government then was in favor of the establishment of a homeland for the Jews in what was then Palestine. Then in 1948, Britain left the mandate. Israel came into being and events took their course. The people here, the very small community, which was here, decided they want to create a country which they had in their mind will need buildings and pipelines and electric lines and railroads and roads. But not only that, they understood the importance also of sociology and philosophy, etc. So they created not only the Technion and the Hebrew University, they created the Philharmonic orchestra. So they went and decided just to go and do it, you know, to go and build a state. And actually the best startup which was created in this part of the world is the state of Israel, which started as a crazy fantasy, which made no financial or no economic sense whatsoever. And this was by creating by many, many startups, not in the high tech, not in the internet, but in agriculture, in job creation, in developing cities, in immigration. And this is actually the underlying power of the startup nation. It's a very young country, and in that sense, it's always been one of innovation. It's been one of innovation of providing political and civil institutions. If you consider the way the country came into being, a lot of refugees from persecution elsewhere in the world. It is a very diverse and quite differing society. That's something that's quite difficult to appreciate as an outsider because we tend to see the Israelis and the Palestinians. There's always been this very strong sense of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and I think that is a way in which the society can really lend itself to technical innovation as well. The founding of the state in 1948 by David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister. The first thing he was worried about is the survival of the country. So that required a military that was gonna defend against five other countries around it with much bigger militaries, much better equipped. So the only way to do that was with superior motivation and better technology. Every boy or girl at the age of 18 joined the military. They're rigorously screened, and the best and brightest minds are sent to the intelligence units. Throughout history, the military and unfortunately warfare has been such a driver of civilian technology. So for example, you know, computer vision to find intruders who are trying to get through to your borders uh, eventually trickles through to the civilian space. Uh, drones, computer intelligence, artificial intelligence, and that leads to, for example, autonomous vehicle technology. Uh, companies like Mobileye, which is a huge Israeli uh, autonomous vehicle technology company. 
Auto, which is a driverless truck company, which was uh, recently acquired by Uber. So that's definitely one very leading trend of which I think Israel is at the forefront. A lot of what is driving the tech industry starts in the military. One thing that's interesting about Israel's innovation story is a lot of factors converging together. It's not just one, it's the, the fact that the whole country is a startup, the military aspect, the, the fact that we're a country of immigrants, all these things feeding together are important. When we wrote Startup Nation, first of all, we didn't realize we were branding a country, but we also didn't realize that we were touching sort of a global nerve. We're living in a world that's changing all the time, and not only changing, but the, the pace of change is increasing. And this is kind of quietly causing a, a panic, I think, in companies, individuals, and in countries, where they say, we have to become innovative. That's the only way we can keep up. And they're right. But the tendency is to think, okay, we want to do that. We want to be like Israel. We want to do it like Israel did. But Israel kind of has a unique story. We have our story. But what's happening actually, what's exciting, is that around the world, everybody is doing this, but they have their own story. Ben-Gurion once said, in Israel, in order to be a realist, you must believe in miracles. Sometimes the greatest miracle is recognizing that the world can change. Through talent and hard work, Israelis have put this small country at the forefront of the global economy. Already we see how that innovation could reshape this region. There's a program here in Jerusalem that brings together young Israelis and Palestinians to learn vital skills in technology and business. An Israeli and Palestinian have started a venture capital fund to finance Palestinian startups. Over 100 high-tech companies have found home on the West Bank, which speaks to the talent and entrepreneurial spirit of the Palestinian people. You know, one of the great ironies of what's happening in the broader region is that so much of what people are yearning for, education, entrepreneurship, the ability to start a business without paying a bribe, the ability to connect to the global economy, those are things that can be found here in Israel. This should be a hub for thriving regional trade and an engine for opportunity. For most people who are in the technology space, if you talk about startups, Palestine is not at the top of the list. It's probably not on the list at all, right? We were starting to think about something that, for all intents and purposes, was impossible to do. Start a venture capital fund in a place where something like this has never even been heard of. You layer on top of that sort of the political and geopolitical complexities of the place, and we really have the official definition of Mission Impossible. Over the last five plus years, there has been explosive growth in what will become the Arab digital economy. We raised $30 million to create these business opportunities despite occupation. At the end of the day, we as Palestinians need to stop thinking of ourselves as victims and we need to think of ourselves as people who despite of our situation can actually offer something to the world. You've got this opportunity in the Middle East. Mobile devices are being used at some of the highest rates in terms of penetration across globally, even compared to developed markets in e-commerce, in media, gaming, business to business. So the startups that we are actually investing in are looking at these markets. Welcome, this is Soutel. We have staff in Jordan in Berlin, in Washington, D.C., and we have staff in Canada. But the developers sits here, so the tech is actually Palestinian tech, and they sit over there. Some of us have computer science backgrounds, but other of us come from the development sector. People specializing in youth, in education, in humanitarian assistance, water, sanitation, and so on. We need that variety of skills in order to manage the type of work that we do in the aid sector globally. In 2006, there were jobs out there, and there was at the same time a 40% unemployment rate among youth. The first solution that we developed at the time was a platform matching job seekers to job providers. 
now Suitel has developed such that we design and deliver custom digital solutions providing capacity building in all different forms from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe spanning some 30 countries. So for example using a basic mobile phone Syrian refugees living in Turkey can text in questions to lawyers to get legal advice. We have also, last month, uh, six of us were actually in Egypt for 10 days working with farmers. And now we're building a platform that would help deliver messages to these farmers to try to enhance their productivity and yield. Or they can share experiences with each other. Has anyone planted potatoes in this environment before? Do you know if it works? What was your yield? In tech in general, you're working to make things better. What we deliver are solutions, solutions to a problem. Of course, Palestinians have faced a variety of challenges and great adversity, so it makes perfect sense to me that we're using Palestinian technology to answer these same questions for people globally. Working in this field is exciting because it's one of the fastest growing sectors in Palestine. It's relying on a skill set that is growing. We're employing Palestinian developers, QA teams and testers and so on. And we're happy to say that we're growing in terms of our employment. I've spent about 19 years abroad and um, among my, my circle of friends, a lot of people would be talking about coming back, but there's always the question of, you know, what would I come back and do, right? And now that has completely changed. Our portfolio is employing 200 people. About 33% of that are female employees that are primarily in technical positions. And, you know, we're really happy about those results because actually it's beating those percentages in Silicon Valley. So Palestine has been able to, to beat Silicon Valley on one end at least. The great thing about innovation is that it transcends borders, it transcends cultures, it transcends religion. You can basically be sitting across the table from somebody who you've never met, who comes completely from a different background and almost instantly speak a common language. Not to say that in a very complex situation like what we have here in, in Palestine, that if a Palestinian sits across the table from an Israeli, that means, oh, you know, now we have peace and everything is fine and dandy and we can, you know, hold hands and sing Kumbaya. It's, it's not about that. If this conflict someday is resolved, the potential of what this region can build together, not just Palestinians and Israelis, but the whole Middle East, what they can build together is nothing short of massive. The funny thing is that if you were talking to somebody from Europe or from the States and they would come here and are positively surprised by what's happening here because they never see some, something like this in the news, you can understand this. But when it's somebody that's less than an hour drive from you, you start understanding that the political situation is standing in the way.